Well, good morning. Uh, as indicated, uh, my name is Kent, and it's been an honor to work here with the kids and families here at our church. And today, we're talking about legacy. As you see on the front of your program, what will we pass down? What will the next generation understand about us as people, as a church? Last week, Larry talked about the stones of remembrance. And as I was thinking about this idea of remembrance, the first thing I thought about was a church, the things that we remember about churches. Now, I grew up in Ohio, and in the Midwest, we see a fair amount of church signs we don't see too many church signs here, but um, you know how we have a fair amount of not only church signs, we have bad church signs. And uh, I remember driving by them thinking, is this really what you want to be remembered for? Like, really, like if I think about your church, this is, this is my thought about you. So I've compiled for your viewing pleasure, my top bad church signs. Here we go. We love hurting people. Not sure if you'd want to check out that church. Not sure if that's what they want to be remembered for. It might be interesting. Church parking. Only violators will be baptized. Okay. Don't, don't violate the parking at that church. All right. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. Okay. <laughs> I'd be a little fearful going to that one. Do you know what hell is? Come here, our preacher. <laughs> no, this is not Black Rock, okay? It's not, this is not our church, okay? Many who see God at the 11th hour die at 1030. <laughs> well, it's almost a scary one, right? Right? Get behind me, Satan. And then uh, choosy moms choose Jesus. Choosy moms choose Jesus. Do you have a choosy mom? And then come here, our pastor. He's not very good, but he's short. <laughs> if you've ever seen any of these church signs, you might remember them. And then this one, Jesus would so smack you in the head. <laughs> I don't know if that's really what they wanted to be remembered for. But uh, we're thinking about this idea of remembrance, and as we finish up a very full summer, we're thankful for those who are new to joining BlackRock from Summer Adventure or from BBS, but there's many who we say goodbye and who will, maybe we'll see them next summer. We may never see them again. And I wonder what will be left in them? What if something happened this summer, what will stick? I wonder who will follow Jesus and who will walk away. We have a working definition of legacy today, and it's this, something handed down from one generation to the next. And I love this saying, inheritance is something you leave for your children. Legacy is something you leave in your children. Now, I have two daughters, and I think about this. What do I want to make sure... But if they get nothing else, they remember this. When we had our two daughters, I had a new job, and it's the most important job I will ever have. What is it for you? What, what, uh, what about your kids, your grandkids, your nephews? What is the one thing that you want them to get from you and how you lived your life? Jenny and I used to live in Akron, Ohio, and I used to volunteer at a homeless mission across the street from the church. And over the months that I would uh, volunteer, that I'd get to know these men, and I'd hear the most heart-wrenching stories of brokenness, bad choices, addiction, broken marriages, estrangement from kids, loss of connection with family. And many of these men were older, and they came to the mission to get help because they knew that time was running out, and they did not want what was left behind to be awake of brokenness and regret. They came before it was too late. Many came from homes that passed down brokenness, and it was the cyclical pattern of brokenness. Probably one of the best examples of this cyclical pattern of brokenness 
in the Bible is the Israelites in the Old Testament. Once the Israelites entered the promised land, we see in the book of Judges, there's this pattern of following God, the next generation getting entangled in sin, and then forgetting about God. A heartbreaking example is found in the book of Judges. You don't need to turn there because we're going to camp out at another section of Scripture today. But uh, in Judges 17, maybe you've heard this story, but there's a, there's a man named Micah from the hill country in Ephraim. And between he and his mother, they had 1,100 shekels of silver. And his mother took 200 of these shekels of silver and gave it to a silversmith to make an idol to put in her son's Micah's house. Definitely, they had fallen away from God. So Micah makes this shrine, and he gets an ephod, which is what a garment worn by the high priest, and installs one of his sons as the priest. And in the meantime, a young Levite from Bethlehem came through, looking for a place to stay, and comes upon Micah's house, and Micah invites him in. Now, no, we do not know this Levite's name, but in verse 10 of Judges 17, he says, live with me. Be my father and priest, and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year and your clothes and your food. So this Levi thought, all right, I got a pretty good deal. I'll take it. So he lives with him, and he's his priest. And we see in the next chapter, chapter 18, that the tribe of Dan comes through seeking a place to settle, and they come across this nice hill country where Micah and his mother live. And while they were there, they recognized the voice of this young Levite priest. And as we read down through chapter 18, it continues to not tell us the name of this priest until we get to the end. And the tribe of Dan ends up overtaking this house of Micah and installing this Levite to be their priest to their false god. And in verse 30, this is the linchpin right here. It says, the Danites set up for themselves the idol and Jonathan son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. This is Moses's grandson who was the priest for these false idols to the tribe of Dan. Moses, our Moses, the one, the follower of God, the one, you know, the leader of the Israelites, the Ten Commandments, the parting of the Red Sea, the one who had the inside track, with God and his grandson is the priest for these false idols. What happened? Here's what we see what happened. The first generation followed God. The next generation assumes it. And the last forgot about God. And they repeat this vicious cycle over and over again. And my friends, it happens today as well. D.A. Carson says, if we assume they know the gospel, they're going to lose it. A Barna Group report found that only 20% of students who were church growing up remained spiritually active by 29. My friends, this is a crisis. And one of the main reasons was lack of adequacy, of adequate foundation in the home. Now, I don't know your spiritual background. Maybe you're new to BlackRock. Maybe you were not taught how to transfer your faith, and you assume kids are getting it, your kids are getting it because you're learning, and we think they're going to assume learning it because they see me. But if we're not intentional, the next generation loses it. Maybe you've assumed your parents' faith. You were not taught it. You just thought it would happen because of your family. What would the future of the church look like if passing the faith was not priority? On a personal level, what would your family look like? Maybe you're dealing with loss of heartache of kids, grandkids, nieces, and nephews who have walked away from the Lord. Now, I wish I could stand up here today and say, all right, here's the top five things you need to do. I wish it was a list or like a class, like come to this seminar and we'll make sure that, the, that your legacy will be passed to the next generation. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. It has to be our life's calling. 
probably the best passage that talks about transferring our faith. And this is where we're going to be today, if you'd like to join me. It's going to be in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Now, most of us probably are very familiar with the first part. Love the Lord your God. We've heard it. It's mentioned other times in Scripture. But notice, if we look closer in verse 5, he starts out by making a declaration first of what we are to love. And kids and youth understand what we value by what we love. They pick up on what we, how we spend our time, our energy, and our greatest efforts. Now, I wonder if we have any sports fans in here, but I wonder uh, if we have any Patriot fans in here. Any Patriot fans? All right, we got a few. So we have, we've, we found a Patriot. There we go. We found a Patriot family. This family does not go to Black Rocks. So probably this is a random family. But they are passing down what they love to the next generation. Now imagine, imagine if uh, this, one of these children was like, were, were like, you know what? I think I want to be a Giants fan. I think I'm switching teams. Right? Some would be, yes. Parents might be, you know what? That whole college fund that you were hoping for, not happening. Or what about this family? Any Mets fans? All right, okay. So uh, as you can see, this is something that the family loves and they're passing it down. Imagine if this kid in blue was like, I think I want to be a Yankees fan, right? This conversation might go something like, you know that car that you wanted to have when you're a teenager? Not happening. You see, kids understand first and foremost what we love. Another example, we went to uh, a seminar, several of us went to a seminar last year at Walnut Hill, and we were making some really cool mission statements for our family, and they gave the example of TV shows. Now, I am a product of the 80s, and I'll tell you, in the 80s, there was one show. Every Thursday night, we had to watch this show. It was like iconic for us. It was... The Cosby Show. Now, I know Bill Cosby's had some problems in recent years, but every Thursday night, that was like our time. And if you watch the show long enough, you started to pick up on what Cliff Huxtable valued. He valued education. That was what was so important that he wanted to pass down to his kids. So when Sandra announced that she was not going to law school to open a wilderness store with Elvin, it did not go over well for Cliff. Now, I'm sure that if I asked you today, above all else, you would probably say, we love God. We love God above all else. But what would your kids say? What would our neighbors say or the people at school say? Your kids might say, yes, we go to church when we have time, but my parents really love this sports team. We never miss it. You know, uh, we, we just, we, we love this as the center. I'll tell you what, I wonder what the next generation would say about us is we really love our phones. Like that, like without our phones, like 10 minutes and like, do we have it where, oh, I, I, I feel itchy because I need to, check my phone. You see, we might be able to fool the people at church by saying we love God the most, but we can't fool those who see us all the time, our kids, our grandkids. And the Bible says that anything that we put above God is idolatry, which brings us to our next important point. And that's what happens outside of the church and who we are is way more important than the one or two hours a week 
that we are here inside of this building. Does your life show that you really love God first above all else? It has to be central. We have a dear, sweet couple in our church uh, with four grown kids, all of whom are walking with the Lord and one who's in full-time ministry. And I I sat down with this guy a couple of years ago and I, I said, hey, what's the secret? How did you have such great kids that are walking with the Lord? I, I, I'd love to, that happen in my family and, you know, anything you can share with me would be great. And this is what he said. He said, I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect man, but we always had Christ as the center of our home. It decided and shaped all of our decisions in this complex world where there are so many competing influences from dance recitals to soccer to lacrosse to swimming, we kept the main thing, the main thing. And I want to share this important point that in a hundred years, what is really going to matter? The only thing that will matter is their relationship with Christ and how they lived to follow him. Is the main thing really the main thing? What would your kids say? What would your friends say? He goes on to give some practical advice here in verse 7, as we go on in this this chapter. Impress them on your children. Another version says, teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Transference of your faith is caught and taught, but I would suggest that it is more caught than taught. You see, at least I... I'll share personally from my family. My parents did have times where they sat us down and they would teach us. But I'll tell you, it meant more of an impact with how they showed me things along the way, how they lived their life to honor God. You see, with kids, the gospel is transferred holistically. They have a hard time understanding concepts. Oh, I hear God is love. What does that mean? They need to see you when you're loving your neighbor and that they understand that. They need to see you when you're sharing a meal with the lady down the street and allowing them to take part in it. They need to see it along the way. It goes on, verse 7, along the way. When you sit in your house, well, along the way. When do we sit in our house? The dinner table. It's a great time to seize the opportunity that this is our house, and this is what we're about, so we want Christ to be in the center of this environment. For us, that's a I mean, we have little kids, so that's a Jesus storybook Bible and maybe five minutes of prayer before somebody throws something at somebody's face or on the floor and and we're able to walk out with a messy, messy table. But at our house, that's what it looks like. He goes on to say, when you walk along the road, well, we don't walk a whole lot, but there sure are opportunities to trap a kid in a metal box strapped in with belts as we're going down the highway for a period of time. It's a great opportunity. For us this year, that was, you know, driving to school, and I'd say, hey, how can I pray for you today, Katerina? How can I, how can I encourage you in those windows of time? It goes on to say, when you lie down, well, bedtime is the opportunity Are you using that? Or when they get up at breakfast, seizing those moments along the way speaks volume to the next generation. Verses 8 and 9 says, Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Basically, it means let it be in the forefront of your home. Let the neighbors see it, that those who enter your home pick up, that we're not hiding about who we are. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is who we are. We have a young man in our church who had uh, just a wonderful, impacting faith from his parents. He's one of our Sunday school teachers. In fact, he's over there teaching right now. He's also one of our counselors. And he's going to share a little bit of his journey and how his family transferred the legacy of faith. So my name is Paul Gian, and I'm 18 years old. I've gone to Black Rock for over 10 years now. And just growing up in a Christian home, I think my parents definitely taught, and not only taught, but modeled what it means to love God with all our hearts. Um, 
So, of course, Sunday was a priority in my family, and going to church, no matter if we had sports or school, um, even throughout the week with the middle school groups and stockade and things like that, I think they definitely taught me what it means to honor God and set apart time for Him and make that a priority. What really stood out to me in my childhood was just watching my parents in the day in, day out, um, and how they loved God and tried to serve Him with their lives. And so I remember just waking up in the morning and finding my mom at the breakfast table doing her devotionals and praying with God. And I think that really resonated with me and my siblings. So I'm really grateful that at home, I had a lot of encouragement to not just keep my faith to myself, but go out into the world and live out my faith and love other people. And so I saw that a lot in my mom, in her compassion for people and just how she shared the gospel whenever she saw an opportunity. And so whether that's in a taxi cab in New York or at the dentist's office or just pursuing her friends who don't know Christ, just seeing that really encouraged me to be bold for my own faith. So I know in a short video like this, it's easy just to come away with the good things in my family life and almost have like a romanticized version of it. But I'd just like to say that Jesus teaches in the Bible, in this world we'll have trouble. And I know my family's had its own share of troubles and dilemmas and difficulties. And what I've come away from those family difficulties and trials is that we can always go to God. And that's what my parents did and my family does is that whenever we have those hardships, we seek God and seek His wisdom and His comfort and His peace and His deliverance. And because of that, we're able to get through those tough times. And so what that's shown me is when I deal with adversity in my own life and in the lows when things aren't going how I envision them, I can always go to God and He's going to be there for me. And because of this, I have um, an anchor for my soul in Jesus where I can find my everything. And even in the highs when I'm, I have success and when I'm tempted to feel prideful, um, my mom always reminds me, she always says this, it's not all you, it's all, his, it's all God's grace. And so she teaches us to be thankful. And so recently I was really honored to be able to speak at my high school graduation and just given that platform, it was really easy for me to feel puffed up and whatnot. But in the end, I heard my mom's voice, you know, and her constant wisdom in that. And so I was able to share about God's grace and how it had brought me to that place and how it had continued to bring me throughout life. And I think that was just a great opportunity, another opportunity of grace that God had given me. And so, of course, when I told my mom that I would be doing this video, she reminded me not to make it about me or her or any of the people that have invested me in me so much at this church, but to make it all about God. Because while my mom, my parents might have planted the seed, and while faithful people in the church have watered it, I think it's ultimately God who has made it grow. So I just want to end with kind of a passage of scripture that's really resonated with me. And it's Hebrews chapter 11 where the author lists all the heroes of faith and the legacy that they left behind for us to follow. In. And I think it's almost like a relay race that we're running where we've been handed the baton from the patriarchs and all the heroes of faith in the Bible. And I've been um, blessed to receive this baton from my parents and from the many people in church who poured into me all these years. And I want to become someone who passes that baton on to others to create my own legacy, um, which is following in the legacy of all the saints, I guess. And yeah, and just walk in obedience with God. So it's, it's, it was just a heartwarming story to hear Paul uh, referencing his parents and, and the church and uh, I, have, I know Paul well, and this is how he lives his life. And now it's great because he gets to do that for the next generation. And Paul brings us to our last point, and that's kids need to get to ownership. Two combined influences have more impact than two individual influences. When it comes to transferring faith to the next generation, the greatest impact comes when there's a partnership between the church and the home. Now, if I could put on my children's ministry hat on for a second. 
I will say that over the years, I've seen two camps. I've seen those who believe heavily in the home emphasis. And this is where they place their high value of teaching and faith, which those are not bad things. They have home studies and memorization parties. They, do, they exceed all expectations that probably most people would know or even be able to, to wrap their minds around. But they are convinced that they know better than the church, and no one can do it as well as mom and dad. And they are the sole developers of their child's growth. The problem comes when these kids hit middle and high school and a child seeks to exert some independence away from mom and dad, and the parents feel they're losing control because they haven't established that partnership with the church. And there's those on the other side that I have seen who have a strong church emphasis. They love BlackRock. They love the kids and the youth program. They want to have their kids involved in everything the church has to offer because we want what's best for our kids. So let's enroll them in another program. The church is where they're getting fed. The church has the answers. The church has the programs. And in the long run, we see that they have farmed out the greatest responsibility of shepherding their child. And these kids grow up to understand what this idea of corporate worship looks like, but struggle understanding what a personal daily walk with Jesus is. The church and the home, it has to be a partnership. And for your kids and for our kids and teenagers, there's nothing more powerful than another voice speaking the same things that you're trying to say in the life of these kids. I'll tell you, a linchpin that I have seen where ownership really happens, uh, we do uh, testimonies at camp. And over the years, I've seen that for a lot of these young kids, these well, growing up teenagers, where they get that ownership, it's on a missions trip. Suddenly, mom and dad aren't around, and this new sense of personal faith and identity in Christ happens. And they're like, this is, this is my faith. This is my walk. Now, I want to stop here for a second. We've covered a lot of ground, and I don't want to leave anyone out. So let me speak directly to those who have grown children who have walked away from the Lord. And maybe today you're hearing this and you feel a little helpless. Maybe you feel that you've missed the boat. And I just want to encourage you. We serve a powerful God. The Bible says in Luke 1, 37, nothing is impossible with God. We pray with you. We pray for your children. Don't underestimate the influence that you do have and use it to keep pursuing your kids towards God. I had a time in my life when I was in my 20s, I, I was an actor, and I was out on the road with a show, and I had a lot of just negative influences coming from different direction. But I could hear, I could hear the voice of my parents speaking into my life as they would call and just let me know that they were praying for me. There's nothing more powerful for a young person when they hear that you're praying for God's direction, when you're praying for God's direction for their life. It made a mark in my life. Even little things, like my mom, even as I was grown, she would give me devotionals every year. Like, I have tons of devotionals at home. But that was her little way of saying, this is the main thing. We want you to keep it the main thing. We know you're out of our house but we want you to remember. So what is it for you? My observation from my standpoint at our church, in our community, we are incredibly busy people. And we have many things and we have many good things. But what I've seen happen is they've squeezed out room for our first love. Many of these things require more of us than we should commit to it, pushing it up the ladder to the center. Maybe you need to reprioritize. Maybe you need to say no to some earthly things so you can say yes to making sure the next generation sees and hears your love for them and for Jesus again. In 100 years, what is going to matter? Maybe it's evaluating what really is your first love. Is your job getting a bit out of control and has become your first love? Maybe it's climbing that corporate ladder. There's nothing worse than climbing that ladder and getting to the end of your life and realize you are climbing the wrong ladder. I have a guy I know right now who 
is looking back at his grown children and just saying, man, I, I just, I wish I had more time. I hope I, I want to, because that part of their early development, I missed it. What is your stones of remembrance? Maybe you use the excuse that, hey, the church, I thought the church was going to do it. I thought I just needed to bring them. Does your family live a life where Christ is the center of your home? And that center is infectious. For me, my grandmother was the one who left an indelible impact of faith. Her favorite Bible verse, which you guys probably know it, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We've heard it. She used to share with me stories growing up. She was one of 10 children, born 1919, raised in the Great Depression. She hung on to that verse as she moved from different houses, growing up, being shuffled around. And at 13, she permanently left home to stay with a family so she could go to high school. When she got married, my grandfather had a lot of health issues. And early on in their marriage with three small children, the doctor said to her to prepare herself, she was going to be a widow. Boy, can you imagine that? Hang on to, hanging on to that verse. It was her bedrock. I can't re- imagine the reliant trust she had to have in her God, almost facing being a single mother with three boys. Thankfully, my grandfather pulled through. But later in her life, when my, grandfather, my grandmother's health was failing and she was moved into hospice care, she got to that stage, you know, the stage where they can't remember who we were as her family anymore, and it was just trying to make her comfort, comfortable. But you know what she remembered? She remembered that verse, and she would quote it. That was what she remembered. And when she passed, when she died, it was inscribed in her tombstone, on her tombstone. That was her literal stone of remembrance. And that was the legacy for me. That's it. It has helped me to trust his leading more, to be okay with not having everything figured out, to remembering that God was faithful to my grandmother and he'll be faithful to me. We all leave something. We all leave a legacy. What is your legacy? We want to thank you for watching and listening to our sermons online. And we hope that uh, you will be inspired to live more like Jesus through these. Please check out blackrock.org for more information about our church. Know that you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And also uh, know that you can give uh, to BlackRock and to our ministry through PushPay, through our mobile app, and on our website. Your uh, donations and your support of our ministry allows us to have uh, these videos online and for us to impact our community.